So you mentioned uh, negativity as something that Nietzsche may have missed a bit or didn't emphasize as much as certainly someone like uh, Hegel or Zizek today. So I'm wondering, um, firstly, how do you feel about this reading of Nietzsche, like a Deleuzian reading, where Nietzsche is this thinker of positivity, will to power, creativeness, activeness, um, the way Deleuze frames him, he's sort of a complete opposite to, to Hegel. And in a way, it's interesting because it gets really complex. Like, is <laughs> Deleuze misinterpreting Nietzsche and Hegel or just Nietzsche or and uh, not Hegel or ju just Hegel, not Nietzsche? Or is he getting them right? So what do you how do you feel about this? Do you think that this portrayal of Nietzsche as the ultimate anti-Hegelian in a way, do you think this is a, an accurate portrayal? Right. I think it's, this is a yeah, really, really great question. Um, and I think a lot is at stake here. Um, no doubt that the, 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 you know, Deleuze has had an enormous impact on 20th century philosophy and his interpretation of Nietzsche um, has, has uh, also been uh, incredibly influential. And it does seem like the key distinction at work here is as it relates to negativity and affirmation. Um, I think that the way I'm trying to approach it is that when I read Thus Spoke Zarathustra, um, it's hard not to notice that the entire story of Thus Spoke Zarathustra while leading up to a type of primordial affirmation is as story, and I think this is important, as story is structured by the negation of the negation. So like the, the best example I can give of that is the way in which the metaphor, uh, which really structures a lot of Thus Spoke Zarathustra of the camel, the lion and the child, is a logic of spiritual transformation, uh, which operates on the negation of the negation. Uh, the camel uh, is a sort of negativity, which is negated for the lion, which works towards a pure affirmation of the child. So the really important dialectical point there is that yes, there is a pure affirmation possible, but your pure affirmation would become uh, very impotent and actually potentially counterproductive to spiritual transformation if you don't include within it uh, the negation of the negation. So um, it's, it's, it's simply the fact that um, if you interpret Nietzsche where he ends, in other words, if paradoxically, if you don't take into consideration the becoming of uh, Zarathustra and Nietzsche's philosophy, then you can just posit some sort of pure affirmation. Um, but if you take into consideration the becoming of spirit, then you can't leave out negation of the negation. Um, the same thing applies to Nietzsche as it relates to the master-slave dialectic um, and the will to power, namely that yes, the will to power does transcend the master-slave dichotomy, uh, but not before working through uh, the master-slave dialectic. The master-slave dialectic is incredibly alive uh, throughout the whole of Thus Spoke Zarathustra. So uh, what I'm ultimately here trying to say is in my own reading of Nietzsche, um, that you have to see him as working through core concepts in Hegel, namely the negation of the negation, the master-slave dialectic, and so forth, and yes, there is a beyond, which I think Hegel would also agree with, namely that in the state of absolute knowing, um, you are kind of uh, a being that has worked through negation of negation and master-slave dialectic and so forth. So it, it, my interpretation is that Deleuze, um, in trying to set himself up as an anti-Hegelian, um, is in some sense, opening up the conditions of possibility for people to think that it's okay to not work through Hegel. Whereas I think the point of the phenomenology of spirit, as Hegel himself says in the preface, is that um, it's kind of like 
uh, a book which is important to have worked through in order to then become a, pro a philosopher proper, um, and then you can discard of it. But the 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 cost or the price you pay if you don't work through the phenomenology of spirit, I think, is incredibly high because the possibility is that you start uh, repeating Hegel without even realizing it. And I do think that that is uh, very much present in Deleuze's work. I think where he goes against Hegel, oftentimes he is becoming uh, the most Hegelian. Right. I, th I think I've heard uh, Zizek say um, something similar about, uh, about Deleuze. And as actually Lacan, he says that about Lacan. So that's an interesting uh, reading of Deleuze. Now you mentioned the, uh, what's it called? The three metamorphoses of spirit from the spoke uh, Zarathustra. And what's interesting is that you use that as an example of negation of the negation. But for me, my reading of that um, like, and I don't have like many readings of certain passages. Like this is just like, one of the things I, the only things I've ever really taken from uh, Thus Spoke Zarathustra and used, and that's that uh, it sort of, uh, uh, it sh shows that negation, there is no negation for Nietzsche, because the child, uh, ultimately, that's not uh, like a real negation in the Hegelian sense of like a coincidence of the opposites or like th uh, an actual no, because wouldn't that be more of like a progressive development from the camel to the lion to the child? Like even that movement itself, I don't think it consists of uh, an actual confrontation with negativity. And even so, like once we get to the child, you're sort of at this, like, as you said, like a pure affirmation of the will. But I think that's like, how do we get there? Wouldn't that sort of be like a sort of like an example of a, a fantasy and illusion for like Zizek. Like I'm trying to think in terms of a Zizekian and Hegelian perspective, wouldn't that be a, a fantasy, the idea that we can somehow get like progressively evolve to this pure will? How does that actually function? Okay. Well, let, let's, let's, let's go through it. So in terms of like the movement of actually confronting uh, with negativity. So like, I think like the common reading of the camel lion child metamorphoses is that um, the camel is a metaphor for taking on a heavy load uh, for disciplining oneself uh, purely for its own sake. Um, so this, this disciplinary process, this carrying a heavy load process um, is um, in some sense, at least, at least how, how I'm interpreting it in terms of, and also how I've sort of observed it among certain individuals who, let's say, don't want to take on a heavy load and want to remain in a childlike state. And this is something that appears throughout Thus Spoke Zarathustra is the distinction between the child who has not become an adult and the adult who returns to the child. I think that's an important distinction. So in any case, this metaphor of the camel that disciplines oneself, that carries a heavy load for its own sake um, is something, at least in my experience, I interpret as a confrontation with a certain negativity because it requires uh, abandoning the sort of lightness or the carefreeness of your original childhood. Um, the lion phase is a type of negation of this sort of discipline for discipline's sake, or a type of carrying a heavy load for, a, for, for carrying a heavy load sake, um, because you don't really, you the spirit hasn't really investigated why it is carrying a heavy load or why it is disciplining itself. In other words, it's not really connected to its own desire. Um, and in order to be connected towards its own desire, it has to take risks. It has to challenge itself, go into the unknown, really figure itself out in terms of its desire in order, in order to go, go deeper into the spiritual process. So at least in sort of the way I'm making sense of this logic is that you, you, you have a certain original negativity at work in terms of if you want to become an adult, if you want to leave the original lightness or the original sort of timelessness of the child with the mother, 
um, that you do need to pick up some heavy object. You can think about like Sisyphus pushing a rock up a, up a hill or something like that. Um, and then sort of the negation of that would be the sort of the pursuit of like a your own desire, your own your own your own sort of passions. Um, and then only then after that there is the the opening up of a sort of potentiality of the pure affirmation. Now, is is that pure affirmation just a fantasy or an illusion? Um, I think even in the work of Zizek, um, I can't really speak for Hegel on this, but in the work of Zizek, um, the status of fantasy and illusion is uh, also sort of um, ambiguous because uh, there is no sort of position where you're not sort of non-phantasmatic or non-illusory. Like uh, in the Lacanian tradition, if you uh, traverse the fantasy, that doesn't mean you are in a non-phantasmatic state. It doesn't mean you are in a non-illusory state. It kind of, even in many readings, you are kind of more uh, overtaken by the fantasy, but you have a sort of a, let's say, at least in my reading, you have a sort of post Oedipal relationship to the fantasy, which I do think could be connected to this uh, reclaiming of the child in some sense, uh, in the sense that before you go through the spiritual metamorphoses of the lion, or sorry, before you go through the spiritual metamorphoses of the camel, the lion and the child, you have an Oedipal relationship to fantasy, namely you have the fantasy of the lost mother, but after you've gone through the spiritual metamorphoses of the camel, the lion, and the child, um, I think there's the possibility of interpreting this as a post Oedipal relationship to a childlike wonder and joy. Um, at least that's a, an idea that I and enjoy okay, playing so, with. No, no, I think that's it's a very it's a very uh, good idea. And like, so I'm wondering, would the in a way would this passage from the child at the beginning you sort of have to go through this process and would the end product which is a child again would that be like the figure which is sort of reconciled with this process of negation to and that is like so it's like a return to the self but in a sublated form which is um you know reconciled with uh, its uh, contradictions and stuff yeah, I mean, for me, when I interpret like the the nature of the overman, uh, I do see it as a concept which um, can be fitted nicely with Hegel's idea of absolute knowing. And I do see both of those concepts as including within themselves certain qualities that you could say uh, involve a perspectival shift on negativity, a perspectival shift on contradiction, a perspectival shift on um, also concepts like conflict or hardship or struggle. Um, I do think that following the phenomenology of spirit, there is kind of a way in which before one is in touch with absolute knowing, there is a type of um, disappointment when it comes to the failure of the object uh, as it relates to the sort of, let's say, the normies, as it relates to the overman or the rabble, as it relates to the overman in, in Nietzsche's work. I do think that there is a type of disappointment as it relates to a transcendental external support system that like most humans require some sort of transcendental external support system, an object which they can hold on to, which would provide safety or security for their identity in an otherwise disorienting and complex and disturbing world. Whereas in the, stat, uh, in the psychological state of absolute knowing or in the sort of psychological condition of the overman, I do think that there is a, let's say, a higher order reconciliation with negativity that seems to open up.